Why was the sea split? The miracle could have happened so many different ways. To save the Jews from the pursuing Egyptians, you can think of a dozen different ways that God could have saved them. The Egyptians could have made a wrong turn and ended up in the middle of the desert someplace else while the Jews continued on their way. You know, lift them all up and put them back down on the other side of the, of the sea. Would it be a bigger miracle if God just built a bridge miraculously? Why necessarily the splitting of the sea? We're about to read the crossing of the sea. So strange how the ten plagues did their job. Pharaoh decides to not only let the Jews go, but urges them to go. Says God is righteous and we were wicked. And then changes his mind and goes chasing after the Jews. And you know the rest of the story. That change of mind is shocking. I mean, here we thought already, we're done. Our problems are solved. We've gained our freedom. We're not enslaved anymore. And then suddenly, we are swallowed up in the, de in the, in the wilderness. An ocean in front, the Egyptians coming from behind, and huge cliffs on right and on the left literally trapped. As the Torah says, the wilderness had them locked in. So God splits the water, the Jews go through, the water comes crashing back down on the Egyptians as they're pursuing. It, was, it must have been really, I don't know, disillusioning, shocking, frightening. When you've already gained your freedom, the miracle has happened, and now another problem? That's a little hard to take. You know, you get used to the problem you have. You kind of adjust and you learn to live with it. There were so many people in Egypt who didn't think they should leave. It was hard, it was difficult, it was dangerous, but it's a danger you already know going out into a desert, who knows? So we're much more comfortable with the pain that is familiar than uh, risking a new pain that we're not familiar with. We've had that experience many times. Like, we come to the promised land after 40 years of wandering. There are battles with the Canaanites and with the Philistines and with all sorts of people. Finally, we uh, inherit the land. We build a base Hamigdash. We're home. We're there. It's great. And then we're invaded by the Babylonians, and they destroy the temple. Just when we thought we had arrived in a good place. That must have been a very difficult disillusionment. So we're in exile for 70 years. We end up in Persia. The miracle of Purim happens. And King Cyrus helps build the second temple. We're home again. Things are great. We're in the promised land. We have the temple. Everything is working. And then the Romans come and destroy the second temple. It's like how many, how many times can you be disillusioned 
before you just stop believing in ever in ever having it having it good now this time after the roman conquest it wasn't a 70 year exile it's 1900 years before i continue with my monologue where i do all the talking i want to invite you to a vip session a zoom session in which we get together to actually have a conversation and discuss all things jewish all things holy all things healthy so click on the link below and join us where we can have a two-way conversation to believe in something for 1900 years and not lose your enthusiasm that it's going to be great and we'll be back in our land and everything's going to be wonderful that's quite difficult but imagine having to have that kind of faith after the temple has been destroyed we were home twice and twice we got thrown out and now we have to believe that it's going to happen a third time and it's going to be better and more wonderful and it'll be permanent it's going to be great boy that is a lot of optimism let's add one more layer 1948 Jews come back to Israel we're home again sanctioned by the UN and now this how many times can you be knocked down and bounce back with real genuine optimistic faith but we're doing it the miracle continues and the miracle is the people anybody who's who's paying attention must have, must notice what's with all the dancing Rallies, people get together, dancing, singing. Soldiers, every time they have a break, they're singing, they're dancing. What, what is that? And it's genuine. Nobody organized it. Nobody paid for it. This is an amazing thing. Now, when uh, Moshe comes to Pharaoh the first time and says, let my people go, Pharaoh gets upset and increases the labor output. Moshe is shocked, and he asks God, why? Why make it worse? Now they're out of Egypt. They are finally free, on their way to Mount Sinai, and they're trapped. We don't, he, we don't see Moshe asking God why. Wouldn't that be an appropriate question? We finally got out, and now we need this problem? Why? Moshe didn't ask. What is the difference? When the work got harder, Moshe complained and asked why. Here, their very lives were threatened. It wasn't just harder labor. This time, Pharaoh was out to kill. And Moshe doesn't ask. There's a great lesson here. The difference is, while they were still in Egypt, 
the question was only how do we how do, how will we be saved we were completely helpless couldn't do anything for ourselves obviously all the plagues were done by god we did nothing so when god says go to pharaoh and things will get better and instead they get worse there was nothing moshe could do but complain here at the at the uh, at the beach we're already on our way to mount sinai we kind of feel empowered We know our mission. We know where we're going. We know what we need to do. We're not helpless. And so to cry to God and say, why? You do that when you have nothing, no other solution, no other option. Here, Moshe was thinking, what do we need to do? We're on our way. We made this commitment. We're going to meet God at Mount Sinai, and we're going to learn how to serve him. So what do we need to do? And in fact, the people were divided into four different opinions. One was, let's go back. We obviously left Egypt prematurely. So just let's just go back and finish whatever job we needed to do in Egypt. The other opinion was, let's just drown ourselves because we're not going back. The third opinion is, let's stand and fight. Don't have much of a chance to win, but let's at least put up a fight. The fourth opinion is, let's pray. That mentality what should we do? That's a positive sign. There wasn't the complaint or the what why is God doing this to us? It was what should we do? Should we fight? Should we surrender? Should we take our own lives? Should we pray? That's a giant step out of slavery. And God's answer confirms this whole theory. God said to Moshe, why are you crying? Why are you praying? This is not a time for prayer. Continue on your way to Mount Sinai. Now that you're taking responsibility, you need to know that if you are doing what you need to be doing and you're going where you need to go, nothing should stop you. Don't change direction. Don't go backwards. Don't die in mid midway. Continue your mission. Stay the course. Once you set out on a mission, you never look back, you never go back, and you never quit. Not even to pray. So there was one man by the name of Nachshon. He walked into the water. God said, continue to Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is on the other side of the water. So he walked into the water. Up to his nostril. And then the sea split. I don't know if you ever heard of or read the book called um, Secret. 
It's a little book, and it basically says that what you expect from life, that's what you're going to get. So God was saying, you know where you're going, you know what you need to be doing, do what you need to do, and nature will cooperate. If the water has to get out of the way, it'll get out of the way. In simple language, when you have a divine mission, nature will never stop you. Because your purpose is so much more true and so much more powerful than physical circumstance. So if you really want to get a little mystical about it, why was the sea split? The miracle could have happened so many different ways. To save the Jews from the pursuing Egyptians, you can think of a dozen different ways that God could have saved them. The Egyptians could have made a wrong turn and ended up in the middle of the desert someplace else while the Jews continued on their way. You know, lift them all up and put them back down on the other side of the, of the sea. Now there's the joke about a kid who goes to Hebrew school and he comes home and his parents, who are not knowledgeable or observant, they say, what did you learn in school today? And the kid says, well, the Jews left Egypt when they were slaves, and they were, and they were trapped, and there was an ocean in the front of them, and they quickly designed and built a bridge, and they threw a bridge over the water, and they were able to get over, and then they burnt the bridge so that the Egyptians couldn't catch them. The parents said, is that what your teacher told you? He says, no, what my teacher told me, you'd never believe. <laughs> Would it be a bigger miracle if God just built a bridge? Miraculously? Why necessarily the splitting of the sea? God was sending us a message. When you know where you're going and you're on your way to serve the purpose for which you were created, you don't need a miracle. You need nature to cooperate. And it will. The waters themselves will get out of your way. Of course, we're going to call that a miracle. But look at the difference. If God had built a, uh, a magical bridge, that would be a miracle. Water getting out of the way, what changed? What new creation? Nothing. The water was there, but instead of blocking the way, they got out of the way. They just moved to the side and let the people pass through. That's what happens. Nature itself gets out of the way. If you're clear and you're focused and you're serving your purpose, nature will not interfere. Nature never goes against God's will. So if God wants you at Sinai, nothing in nature is going to prevent you from going. Nature does not resist God. It obeys God. And if you're on your way to obeying God yourself, nature will obey you. That's the nature of nature.
And that is even more exciting than a miracle. If God had, for example, picked up the entire people, all two million of them, and deposited them at the foot of Mount Sinai, that would have been a miracle. But what would that what would that show us? What would that what insight or wisdom will we have gained? On the contrary, we would have become more dependent on God's miracles. I think we learned the lesson quite well, so that even after 1900 years of homelessness, statelessness, and then we finally get a state, and that's challenged and attacked and condemned. How do we not lose all of our enthusiasm and all of our optimism? How do we not get angry at God and say, why don't you save us? We have learned to take responsibility. We know there is something we need to do, of course, with God's help, but we need to do something. So as disillusioned as we feel, we don't quit. We don't throw it back at God and say, it's up to you. I'm done. I can't, I can't go on anymore. I am too disillusioned. We don't do that. Of course, we ask God for help. But help means I'm doing something and I need help to succeed. Not I'm, I'm passive and I'm leaving it all up to you. So now that we read about the splitting of the sea in the weekly Torah portion, it's very encouraging concerning our situation today. We thought we were home free. The, the League of Nations or the United Nations voted that we are entitled to, a, to our land. We were so thrilled, finally, finally. And then we're attacked. One war, another war, a fourth war, a fifth war. And the soldiers dance. <laughs> I mean, they're either crazy living in total denial, or they have this incredible, indestructible optimism. Pretty awesome. But for everyone in their own lives, this is a really important message. Nature is not your enemy. It will never be your enemy. The only danger and the only enemy is if you forget your mission. If you give up on the mission, well, nature is not going to surrender to you if you don't know where you're going. But as long as you know where you need to be, nature will not interfere. Nature will actually help. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic and you're looking for more information or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that. And that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it.